How many of y'all believe that Jesus has the power and the authority to heal your bodies, to deliver you from dem demonic oppression, addictions in your life, whatever it is. But ultimately, sin. Because everybody's sick with sin. Not just sick, but death. Amen? Verse 17 connects this with Isaiah 53, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Let's look at that in Isaiah 53. You know, Isaiah 35 talks about when Messiah come, He would heal people physically. He did. Miraculous, supernatural miracles of healing. And then Isaiah 53 talks about how He would come and heal people, heal us of our sin sickness. Amen? Verse 4, Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. See? And the healing is connected with transgression. The healing that he came to bring ultimately was not just healing for the body, but to heal us of our transgressions, our sin. And he paid a price for that. Brother and sister, he paid a price for that. He paid a price to heal the sick physically. He paid the ultimate price to heal us of our sin sickness. That was the cross. When Jesus started healing people, that's when the religious leaders started giving him a hard time. Because they didn't like it. He paid a price to work those miracles. Amen. But he's always available to minister to people no matter how tired he got. What an amazing example. Praise the Lord. So we, just, we need to be thankful. We need to appreciate what God has done for us. Amen. Recognize what he did do for us. Praise the Lord. And understand the authority of the enemy has been broken by his power and his authority in our in our lives. You know, with all these multitudes gathering around Jesus, he, you'd probably think he would be really excited. And all these people showing up to church, you know, we're having revival now. Because all these people are coming to church. You know, you can have revival. You can have special meetings. And a lot of people may come to church, but that doesn't mean you're having revival. Sometimes when we look at numbers, we say, man, the church is really having revival. You can have numbers and not be having a revival. Right. Here all these people are gathering around Jesus. The multitudes are gathering around Jesus. They've heard about how he heals people, how he delivers people from demonic spirits. They've heard about how he delivers people. And so now a crowd is coming. But Jesus knew when he looked at the crowd, all they were were thrill seekers. Oh, there was a few, you know, here and there that had an honest seeking for God. But a lot of the crowd that came that day were not honest seekers. They were thrill seekers. They were just looking to be entertained. And so the Bible says when Jesus sees the multitudes gathered around him, he doesn't say, yay, look, disciples, look at the numbers. He says, it's time for me to get away. He wasn't trying to escape the duties of ministry, but he recognized that the people that were coming in those services, all they were was seeking a thrill. That the majority of them had no desire to live for him. And that's the way it is sad to say, brother and sister, not, you know, when people come to church sometimes, they don't come because they're really, really ready to make a commitment to God. They want to come and see the show. You know, they want to come and experience some thrill. Jesus knew that. Thank God for honest seekers today. But not everybody that comes to church are honest seekers. That's why I say you could have a church of 10,000 people. But that doesn't mean you're in revival. The Bible says that heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. 
Heaven doesn't celebrate when thousands come to church. Heaven celebrates over one sinner going to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I've sinned against you with my words, my thoughts, my actions. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse my soul with your blood. Heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. Not over the crowds that go to church. The Bible says when they started gathering around him, the multitude started gathering around Jesus. Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, it's time for me to leave. If it had been you and I, we might look and say, there's no way I can leave. Look at all these people. When all the people showed up, that's when Jesus said, I'm, I'll see you. I'm leaving. You know why? Because he recognized they were just thrill seekers. Amen. And so the Bible tells us here. Amen. Verse 18. When Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart on the other side. The other side of what? Galilee. Lake Galilee. He said, we've got to get on the other side. We're leaving this crowd. We've got to get away from this crowd. Why? Why would he say that, brothers and sisters? Because he knew what was in them. He knew what he could do. He, he didn't question that. It wasn't just because he was tired. He wanted to get away from the crowd. He knew what was inside of those people. And so that's why he looked at his disciples and said, let's go to the other side. We're going to leave this multitude, this crowd. Now, I'm asking you, brothers and sisters, if you were a minister and you saw a bunch of people show up at your church, you probably wouldn't do what Jesus did and say, oh, I'll see y'all. Glad you came to see you. No, you say, I got to be there because look at all these people. See, Jesus saw things differently from the way we see it. Because Jesus isn't in the multitudes of the crowds that come just to see, you know, be a, sil- a, a, a thrill seeker. He's there to save men's souls. Looking for honest men, honest women that know they have a need. And are willing to make a true disciple of Jesus Christ. He just did things different than what we do. Amen. He would be there if you got a, got a handful of honest seekers. He'd be there all day long to minister to them. But he, was, he wasn't about numbers with Jesus. When the numbers showed up, that's when he said, I'm leaving. Amen. Think about that. So he went on to the other side. And the Bible says, this, verse 19, a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. He said, I want to go with you. But see, Jesus Knew what was in that scribe. This scribe is just a thrill seeker. He likes the miracles that he's seeing. Wow, this is awesome. Look, look at this miracle. Look at these devils being cast out. This is, a, this is amazing, you know. Thrill seekers. See, so this man said, I'll follow you wherever you go. Why? Because he liked what he was seeing. He liked the thrill. Amen. Well, what does Jesus say to this scribe? Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath no way where to lay his head. He's not talking about sleeping at night. He's talking about, I'm looking for people to place my authority, my headship in. Amen? Amen. Now, we're going to apply it both ways. But I want you to understand that Jesus is not just talking about a place that don't have a place to sleep. He said, I'm looking for a place to lay my headship. I want to be Lord in people's lives. Right? It's about his authority. He's the king. He's shown his kingdom and his kingship through these miracles. When he was on the sermon, preached the Sermon on the Mount, he's the king preaching there. He's looking to be the Lord of somebody's life. He didn't come to bring entertainment for, uh, for uh, thrill seekers. 
He came to be your Lord, not just your Savior, not just your healer, not just deliver you from spirits, not just to get you over your addictions. He came to be Lord of your life. And people follow Jesus all day long for a thrill. If he'll break my addiction or he'll get me delivered or if he'll feed, my, feed me, I'll follow you. No, Jesus said, I want you to be my disciple. I want to be Lord of your life. Don't be just looking for miracles. Don't be this kind of a person. What are you going to do for me? Say, Lord, I'll follow you whether you go. I want to make you my Lord. Amen. Amen. Headship. And when we do that, we have to understand what Jesus said. The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. So when you make Jesus the Lord of your life, sometimes you're going to have to get rid of your securities. Amen. Think about it. He said the foxes have, the birds of the air have nests, the foxes have the hose, the foxes have hoes, but Jesus had no way to lay, lay his head. Why would he say this thing to this man, this scribe? Why would he let him know the reality? You know, here's the thing, brothers and sisters. What Jesus is doing is, you know, you get a contract sometimes. You see the big print, right? Jesus is showing you the fine print of being a disciple. He's showing you the fine print of what it's going to cost you, what it's going to cost you, and what it's going to cost me to follow him. And that might mean you might not have a place to sleep, a place to lay your head. The birds of the air have nests. The foxes have holes. You know, the jackals and foxes, they would go and they would roam around into the haunted haunts, haunted places. But Jesus said, I don't have a place to lay my head. And what he's saying to this scribe is this. If you're going to follow me, I'm going to have to be the Lord of your life. I'm going to have to have headship. I'm going to have to have a place for, to lay my head in your life. I'm going to have to be the head of your life. I'm going to tell you what to do, tell you, tell you how to live, tell you where to go. I'm, he said, I want your life. And if you give me your life, there's going to be times like this. Might not have a place to lay your head. Amen. The security of life is not going to be there. See, what Jesus is saying to this, as he leaves the multitudes, he's looking at this man who said, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, really? Oh, Really? Are you willing to follow me where I go? If you are, you have to be a true disciple. And you have to understand, I'm Lord. And that means you, it may cost you to live for me. You may have to give up. It may cost you a lot to be in ministry. Well, first of all, let me apply it to the, to the person that wants to be saved. Let me tell you something, brothers. If you want to be saved today... Nothing else can be more important to you than Jesus. Because when you follow him, you may have to pay a price. And you may have to give up some things in your life. It may cost you. Now, in the area of ministry, what Jesus is showing you, you go into the ministry, you may lose some securities in your life to do that. Think about that. He's saying it'll cost you. To serve me. Are you willing to pay that price? A lot of people are not willing to pay that price. Amen. To be a minister, to be a servant of Jesus Christ, means there are going to be times you're going to have to give up some things. It's going to cost you. You might, have the very, you might not have the very securities of life if you really follow him. Now, what was this man's response to the headship of Jesus being in his life? He did not give him a place of headship in his life, as far as I can tell, because we never hear from this man ever again. The Bible doesn't say that this man followed Jesus. This is the last we ever hear of him. He must have been one of those thrill seekers, you know. What will God do for me? Jesus said, now I'm going to give you the fine print. If you follow me, it's not going to be easy. If you follow me, it's going to be hard. If you follow me, it's going to cost you something. If you follow me. 
You're going to have to be willing to give up the very, some very, the very securities of your life at times. Amen. So he leaves the multitude because he knows what they're about. He knows what's in them. And this man is just an example of a thrill seeker. Jesus is looking for true disciples, brothers and sisters. True disciples. And when Jesus says things like this, what's he, what is he doing? It's a positive. It's not a negative. It's a positive. What he's doing is saying, is I'm looking for strong disciples. And by saying this, he's weeding out, weeding out the uncommitted. It's not a negative. You have to understand this. It's a positive. And he's just telling you right. He's not trying to hide anything. He's not trying to cover you. He doesn't say, hey, man, if you follow me, you're going to get everything you want. It's going to be wonderful. You know, you're going to get raises at your job, promotions at your job, new cars, new houses. He doesn't say that. He doesn't teach that. He said, if you want to be a true disciple of mine, it's going to cost you. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging. He doesn't hide this from us. He's very truthful. He comes right out. If you're going to be a disciple, this is what you can expect. But see, today we have a lot of people, especially in America, man. It's all about what God's going to do for me or what somebody else is going to do for me. And Jesus said, let me talk to you a little bit about this. It's not going to be just about what I can do for you. It's going to be about what you do for me. I'm going to give you the fine print you might not want to read. That's why the majority of people, brothers and sisters today, don't live for the Lord. Because they want their own life. They want their own way. Are you understanding this? So Jesus, yeah, the fine print. He's giving you the fine print, brothers and sisters. He's letting you know it's not going to be easy. And that's why the majority of people aren't aren't on this road. Because it's not easy. Amen. Amen. What Jesus said is sometimes you get in the church, you start serving the Lord with everything you've got. What he's saying is it, it might get harder for you than it was before. A lot of people come to church and God does great things for them, you know. Then all of a sudden when he requires something from them, or they're going through some things in their life, they say, well, it's too hard to live for the Lord. I'm quitting the church. Jesus is giving you the fine print right now. If you're that kind of person, you might as well quit right now. Don't waste your time. And I'm not trying, I'm not asking you to, I'm just telling you. Read the fine print on the contract. And understand what you're getting into before you get into it. That's why we don't beg anybody to come to church. We don't beg anybody to live for God. We don't do that. We do just the opposite. When you get, are you sure you want to do this? Amen. You know? You know, like, are you, sh- are you really sure you want to go to our church? You might think about going to the church up the street. I don't know if you want to go to Bible Center Fellowship because, yeah, God calls us to live for Him there. We read the fine print, you know. We understand our responsibility. Now, if you want to be a part of that, come on in. Hallelujah. But I'm not going to hide anything from you. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard, sometimes extremely challenging. But if you're up to the challenge and you want to be his disciple and you want to follow him, even if it means you don't have the securities you're looking for, then you're in the right place. But if you want to play church, this is not the place you want to be, as you can see. Right now, you're not going to have any problem out there in TV land. 
you won't have any problem finding a place to sit in this church. And there's a reason for that. We read the fine print. Somebody said hallelujah. Hallelujah. And they're, they're, you know, there's some people, they, they get in for a while, and they're doing pretty good for a while, but then after a while, they fall off. You say, oh, man, I didn't know. I, huh. I didn't know I was going to have to quit my, I didn't know I have to qu- quit sinning. <laughs> you mean I got to quit sinning? Oh, well, no, I don't want nothing to do with that. I didn't know I, I thought I could be a Christian and do all that stuff, too. No, I'm reading you the fine print. Jesus Christ giving you the fine print. You get in his kingdom, you don't get to keep doing all that crazy stuff. God calls us to righteousness, to holiness, to godliness. Say praise the Lord. And people well, I didn't I didn't know if I got in the church that I was gonna have to quit lying. I didn't know I was going to have to quit drinking. I didn't know I was going to have to quit running after all, you know, the women and all the men. And I'm not, I'm not running after men, but, you know, I didn't, as a man saying, you know, as a man talking, I didn't know I was going to give up women, be committed to one. You know? Well, you know if you're a woman, I didn't know I was going to have to give up running after men. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? I didn't know I was going to do all that. You, 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 nobody told me I'm going to have to quit smoking and drinking. And nobody told me that I'd have to stop cussing. I want to be able to cuss. And... I'm reading to you the fine print. And I'm telling you, if that's the kind of person you want to be, this is not the place you want to be. God, I've been in this thing almost 40 years and he's still spanking me. He's still calling me to a higher level of consecration and lordship. Well, talk to us, Pastor. Tell us what's going on in your life. Shut up. (laughs) I'm just telling you, man. You know? So we, we just have to understand. Look at your name and say, I'm, a re- I'm reading the fine print. She is giving you the fine print. Well, I didn't know it was going to be like this. I didn't know it was going to cost me my family. I thought my family would follow me right in the church with me. And I found out they wouldn't do it. I didn't know that was going to happen to me. Praise the Lord, church. Have you read the fine print? The birds of the air have nests. The fox, foxes have holes. But the son of man have no place to lay his head. We don't hear nothing from that man ever again. And it's just like so many people come to church. And man, I'm going to tell you something, brother and sister. And I love everybody and I want everybody to be saved. But I've seen them come and they were sitting in this church. And I'll preach the word of God to them. And some of them get an old attitude, you know. Well, I know exactly what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with this old scribe. You know, and I, praise the Lord, I really try, I try real hard not to offend people. And I really do try hard not to run people off. Hallelujah. I really do. I I want people to be saved. But I can't avoid reading the fine print to you. 